It's Gun Storage Check Week. Help prevent unwanted access to your firearms. No one wants their unsecured gun to be used in an accident, a suicide, or a crime. Use lock boxes, safes, and locks to secure your firearms. Learn more at GunStorageCheck.org. That's GunStorageCheck.org. Brought to you by NSSF, the Firearm Industry Trade Association. You know, just like physical illness, mental illness can be overcome. We just got to inspire people to believe that. The mental health community and the firearms industry have spent way too much time running parallel to each other without communicating. It's time we change the narrative and destroy the stigma that we both face. Walk the Talk America presents Guns and Mental Health, a podcast for firearms owners, clinicians, and the curious public. All right, everybody, welcome back to a special live episode of the Walk Talk America podcast. Today, I am joined with by Kevin Berry and Kenny Barlow, like two familiar faces from Walk the Talk America. And we are going to discuss the week that we have had. We, we had the Goals Conference, and uh, I was out in D.C., so I want to recap some of that. But how are you doing, fellas? Doing good. Kenny. Yeah, doing great. Thanks. Yeah. Good, good to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. I feel here, like Kenny. I just saw I, you, man. I just saw you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just dive right in, man. What was your initial thoughts of the inaugural goals for those that are listening? That might I, everybody probably knows what it is at this point. Uh, but goals is gun owners of America. There is their inaugural conference in Knoxville, Tennessee. Two days, actually, it's three days if you count the media day, right? With the range day. Um, what were your initial thoughts, Kenny? Uh, I thought it was great, actually. Um, you know, Gun Owners of America has sort of been uh, has been this low key, uh, two way absolutist kind of uh, uh, a group enjoying uh, enjoying what they do. And uh, you know, I've, I've I've followed them for a while, and so I think it. Uh, I think with things uh, uncertainty with uh, organizations like the NRA and stuff like that, and what the future holds uh you know there's other people that kind of want to uh um step up and, and do their part you know to help as well and i think uh go has been really good about that and you know i was i was impressed with what they what they were able to put put together uh there was a a lot of uh, a lot of attendance uh, from the exhibitor side of things um you know uh, stalwart uh members of the industry and the manufacturers and, and exhibitors that were there uh, you know everybody from Century to uh, who else was there? Man, um, everybody Caltech, Caltech, High Point. Uh, our friends at High Point, I love them. Wait, why are you laughing? Why? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> no, I just because I know I know what everybody when I said High Point, I know what every listener was probably going to think. Oh, High Point. No, but you know the, them. Um, yeah, everybody was there. Uh, Smith and Wesson was there. Uh, you know. Recoil was there. Recoil Web was there. P- pitching CanCon, and uh, you know a whole whole bunch of people were there. Um, and I, I, you know, and I like the audience. Uh, I find the audience the the, the uh, gun owners of America has uh, found. I en- I enjoy that. It, it typically skews younger. It's th- it, they, they 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 skew more um, tech savvy. They're um, you know there was a lot of a lot of like early 20s to early 30s attendees there like i they, they came out for this um and so you and you know these guys find it it's not that they're not finding the nra i'm sure these 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 people are very aware of who the nra is but i think that they're um they find that the tone and the messaging from goa is uh is more to their liking um but uh, i found that refreshing yeah it's it was nice to see and catch up with a lot of especially like people from the influencer side that you know we get to only see at these shows. I mean, you and I have been doing shows for so many years. And as a matter of fact, like that's, that's something I want to touch on, right? Like when is, when is, when is it too much? Like when are there too many shows and how, how do these manufacturers manage the budget for attending shows? If you are a firearms manufacturer, you're a company associated with the, the firearms industry has to be astronomical at this point because 
these are the shows that are like open to the public, but there's so many shows that aren't open to the public that a lot of like, take for example, the influencers, right? Like I was at a table full of people and they were asking me when my next show is. And I was like, I got to go to NASGW. And I could tell they were all like, what is that? Right? <laughs> like they don't even know what that is, but it's just like, there's such an expense to this. And I remember when I owned Eagle, uh, you know, people would ask me like, Oh, shot show. And I'm just like, yeah, shot show for me is like taking $130,000 and just lighting it on fire. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you go out and you do, you do it to support the industry and you do it just to make sure that everyone knows you're, you're okay. And you're still there. But you know, uh, some of these shows, I, w I wonder how organizations measure the success of them. Yeah. You know, it's a great yeah. question. That is a great question. And, and it, it depends. It depends on, there's so many variables to that too, you know, cause the, you have to couple to that, the fact that the industry uh, in general has typically been uh, ebb and flow, you know, lots of peaks, lots of valleys. And so it depends on what's going on in the industry, uh, not only in the market, uh, but in terms of politics in general, what the economy is doing, like you, you kind of, you have to kind of benchmark these things for different years and, and, the ch and that, pivot that allows you to pivot your goals a little bit or you have to um so like in uh in years where you know the industry is up and things are moving along and everybody's kind of doing what they're supposed to be doing yeah you attend these shows as sort of a uh hey we're still here you know we, we value this industry we want to show support to the organizations that put them on um and then you know the other times it's uh you you put you out there to, to say the, almost the exact same thing but it's like hey remember we're here please uh, buy our product, you know, whatever. And it's, uh, uh, it just sort of depends. It's, you know, and, uh, like to your point, a lot of these are not buying shows. Uh, you know, a lot of these are, uh, relationship building shows and, and forward facing ones, but yeah, a lot of them are not open to the public. So it's, it's, you, you, it's really hard to compress it down to one line out of a butt on a budget and go, what's the ROI on this? Because it changes from, from show to show to show and their, uh, what they're meant to be, what the, what the goals are that are meant to be accomplished at each one. Yeah. I, for me as an attendee, I wanted to attend the inaugural one. I felt like it was important for me to be there and kind of support what the mission was, but I was also working out of the Avidity arms booth. So for Avidity arms, it was a good opportunity to get in front of some people that we know had never heard of the firearms company, right? Because it's still fairly new. I mean, You'd say it's been about a year. Um, so so there's a benefit to that. But this show is unique in the sense, too, that not only did you have regular foot track traffic walking through, but there was a lot of breakout sessions with topics and uh, panels and, you know, topics that are relevant to the industry now. Like um, I was able to sneak away and attend one panel, which was the diversity in the firearms industry um, group and you know, they had Tony Simon from uh, the diversity shoot up there. They had Yehuda Raymer, who's the Pew Pew Jew. Um, I think Antonia Okafor was up there and Diana Muller uh, kind of just talking about the different groups that are in there. Did you get to see any of the panels or were you, because I know you were walking around and we were walking around most of the time. And I know we didn't go to panels. So, yeah, I, I didn't get into any of the panels. I've, I've caught consequences of it from social media and, and recaps and such, but I didn't get to see any of them. Jake, it's time to spotlight one of my favorite organizations in the firearms industry, the National Association of Sporting Good Wholesalers. Yeah, let's do it. Not only was I a customer when I owned Eagle Imports for many years, but they're also a sponsor of Walk the Talk America and our mission. The NASGW is comprised of wholesalers, manufacturers, independent sales reps, media, and service providers, both national and international, all whom have a primary focus on shooting sports equipment and accessories. As a trade association representing the business interests of its members, NASCW's mission is to bring shooting sports buyers and sellers together. For more information about the NASGW, visit the association's website at nasgw.org. That was a good read, Michael. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like we hang out in these circles and I feel like I can almost give some of the speeches that I was watching some of the people, people give. And then I had to remind myself that it's the people that are attending the show that that need to hear those messages since they haven't heard those messages before. Um, oh yeah, but no, it's a good mix. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it. Yeah, that's the that's the the thing about going to all these shows and and it and again depending on the show too. Like when we were when we were when you were at 
uh, Eagle Imports and, you know, we would go to the the shows when we're pitching our product. Like we just got to familiar with the pitches that everybody was doing almost to the point where we could just work each other's booths if we really wanted to, because we saw each other so frequently and heard it so much. It's almost like we could give, you know, if, I, I bet if you were so inclined, you could get up there and give Yehuda's exact speech because it's, it's just what you're, what you're engaged in all the time. Well, Kevin, especially since we had him on the podcast, like, five days before that show happened. <laughs> you okay. know what I mean? I was like, okay, here's the people who own ARs don't get in cattle cars part. Like, I, <laughs> you know, um, Kenny, t- tell it. Which is a good line. It. I think that's a great line, but oh, it's yeah, a great it's, line. Yeah. I think when people, like, I think when people hear about Yehuda, it just, it kind of blows their mind that someone like them exists. You know what I mean? I think he does some amazing work and, you know, and that's, that speaks to, what I, you know, for people that are outside of the industry that look in, to the inside, I, I think that mostly, mostly people think it's, this is like a middle-aged white man's convention. And, and it's true to a, a certain point, but I think, especially, you know, you know, this, like the diversity has changed. It's like we, there, it's become way more diverse over the years than say oh, like my, my first shot show in like 97 or, you know, my first NRA show. So you're just you're just seeing so many different groups of of people come forward to say like, hey, the Second Amendment is for me, or you know, this is this is what I specialize in, it, right? Whether it's somebody who owns an organization like, you know, Carrie from We the Female that specializes in uh, domestic violence victims, to Yehuda who's taken that the uh, the market to the Jewish community, saying like, look, don't let anyone tell you this is not for you, and this is why it's important to us any marginalized group. So it's, it's been pretty cool. Why don't you uh, tell, tell the audience what you were also doing there from the regal standpoint? Cause I think, you know, I was shocked to see you. I didn't think you were going to show up and then you, you ended up there and uh, you know, and then I was watching you work. So I think it's a, uh, I think what you do is fascinating because you're more like a behind the scenes guy when it comes to safety and responsibility, but you're also out in the open, right? Like, like what you do for Project Child Safe, and you know what your company does for everybody else. You know you are the the gun locks. Yeah, and uh, and I wanted to tag what you were saying uh, about diversity real quick too, and then I can address that. Is I, I yeah, you have seen this market shift from uh, the single the single message of cold dead hands into the the big tent of of ideas in inside the industries. You know, with uh, either uh, black or Jewish gun ownership female gun ownership, um, uh, liberal, like the liberal gun owners. Uh, I love seeing that. Um, but then also in, in terms of messaging, like the, the types of things we, I think that that has led to changing the dynamic of the types of things we want to talk about, like, which is why walk the talk is able to thrive now, because now we're, it's, we're forcing the car. We want to have conversations about mental health. We want to have conversations about secure storage. And we want to have, you know, I've, I've, I've sat through many a class and heard the, you know, my, my safety is my trigger finger and my safety is my brain and I'm, you know, whatever. It's like, no, my safety is also my safe. My safety is my gun lock. My safety is whatever. And we can have those conversations now. Um, and, and that's, that's what we've been doing at Regal. So for the longest time, Regal products has been producing all the, all the cable locks and all the trigger locks that you see being given out in uh, the, when you buy a new firearm. And so we've been around for decades and, and doing that and you're right behind the scenes um, but you know, we are that we are gun locks. We, that is our bailiwick and, and what we've been doing forever. So what we're trying to do now is pivot to a more forward facing industry, uh, you know, industry and customer facing, um, organization and let you to let people know that we're here. We want to talk about secure storage, uh, secure storage, uh, shouldn't be caught, isn't controversial to talk about, you know? Safe storage of firearms isn't isn't a controversial topic, nor should it be. And we should talk about it. It should go hand in hand. Anytime you go to the range, anytime you go, you, you know, anytime you're buying a gun at a new gun store, um, and that's part of what brought me uh, up there. So there's several projects that we're working on uh, right now, uh, both behind the scenes with the as an OEM vendor to the manufacturer. So we're I was talking to a few of the to, to a few of our partners from the manufacturing side of things, uh, but then also um, in terms of how do we pivot? So I was having conversations with TriggerCon and CanCon about uh, secure storage. Uh, how do we how do we come up with a secure storage sponsorship? Or uh, talking to um, 
uh, our partners at the company called Occupy. Uh, we're going to be releasing a product called Secure Me, which is a a smart and app enabled uh, system that uses a movement sensor uh, embedded in the cable and gun uh, the cable and trigger locks that pings your phone uh, if it senses movement. You can use those same sensors in a variety of applications uh, on your safe door, on your the door to your gun room, on the uh, on your liquor cabinet, in a pill bottle, uh, any other broader applications to that that works in this in this uh, ecosystem that Occupy has developed. And uh, so those those are just a few of the things that we were there uh, to do. Yeah, it's really cool, Kevin, because the, like the, the the and I always love deferring to Kevin because he he's not from the firearms industry. He's learned this through walk talk America. So it's always good. He's like the fresh pair of eyes on everything or just, you know, it reminds me of myself, like when I came in in the late nineties, right. Um, just kind of like taking it all in and, and then making your own opinions from it or just seeing behaviors and things like that. But it's really cool. It's like at one point we're all sitting in the booth looking at that technology and um, Kenny was basically breaking it down and it was uh, Chris Dover, Clover Tack was, was in there with us. And it was really cool watching like Chris be able to get the concept of what this is. Whereas like years ago, so many gun owners would be like, I'm not tracking my gun. You know what I mean? I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Like, um, and now just even going beyond just firearms, right? Like Chris was like, Oh, you could use this for liquor cabinets and all kinds of things. Like this is like, exactly. Like if you don't, if you don't want to use it for its purpose, find the other purposes in it, but, but know that, you know, if you have to put it on your firearm for whatever be the reason, maybe you got grandkids coming into town or your cousins, your nephews or something like that. And you're just like, I want some, an added layer of, you know, security on this thing. Then that's when I'll use it. You know, if I'm by myself in my house, like, and I'm hell bent against that, I don't have to use it then. But um, it's kind of having that messaging out there. And I actually watched that gentleman speak from it. It was called tag me. Yeah, What's their it? their version of uh, Occupy will be called tag me. Right, and and uh, you know he had a decent crowd in there, and uh, he didn't get booed off stage or anybody <laughs> like that. So you know you could see the tide is changing, which is cool. Yeah, and and I you, you I think you said two interesting things there uh, to, that I can that I want to touch on is uh, the int- the intrinsic value uh, that I think you're I think that you're right there there's there's been a, a shift in our in our in our mindset such that when people come up they almost instantly get it they see what it does instantly and go I have a million uses for this uh, and you did they didn't no no one really needs convincing them. Especially because you, you you point out at the it's just a movement sensor, it's just an accelerometer in a plastic housing. If we're being honest, there's no tracking, there's no GPS. Big Brother's not watching, but it is. You can put ten of these in a system, and it pings your phone. The end, uh, you know, and uh, and it's not, um, you know, it's not a it's not an emergency thing. It's not like hey, um, you know, your guns moved, call the cops. It's um, you know, the, at at its core, it's. I've got to go to, I've got to go run an errand and my 13 year old's at home. Um, it's just that added layer of security. Oh, my gun. Why did my gun safe open? I'm going to make a call. Hey, what are you doing? Right. Um, and, and in fact, I was at another, I was at another event, uh, showing this product, uh, a couple of weeks ago in Portland and this woman broke up, broke my heart. Um, I, she said, what is this? And I showed it to her uh, she was familiar with our, with our, uh, cable locks. And I showed her what this new system is. And she just started sobbing at our booth. And she said, if I had, if this product had existed two years ago, my 16 year old would still be alive because she, she was using her cable lock. It was, the gun was completely locked up and and stored appropriately, but son found a key and ended up shooting himself. And, you know, you hear those stories and you go, okay, we're definitely on the right track with this kind of stuff. And we talk about that all the time. You talk about that all the time with, with mental health. Uh, is that the time and space when I, what I like, to, I like to colloquially call it a wedge. You want to create a wedge between the idea and the action. And you know, that's, that's time and space. That's what creates that wedge. Right. Um, and so that's, I'm glad that people are talking about that and they they feel comfortable talking about that. 
And like I said, secure storage not being controversial, it isn't controversial. People are more comfortable talking about that. Yeah, it's really interesting. I I was talking to one of my mentors who was in the firearms industry for many years, and um, it was funny. Like he was he was talking about, oh, like it's been awesome to see what you've done with Walk Talk America and how how far it's come and how people are starting to kind of realize like we kind of have to have the you know I always say it's the socially conscious two A right like like corporate social responsibility all those icky terms that like the other side <laughs> uses that maybe we should have leaned into years ago. Um, and, and we wouldn't have this PR problem. I mean, I'm sure we still would, but like, at least it would, it would help, you know, we'd be a lot further along than we are now, but it's kind of funny. He like, he's like, yeah, I almost got myself kicked out of the firearms industry. Cause I was one of the, I was one of the people that came forward and said, maybe we should be including a gun lock in every box. Like he was talking about like how far it's come since then. Right. Like you couldn't even say like, yeah, maybe we should just put this in the box because at that time, the industry's attitude was no, like not an inch. Like we're not compromising anything like there's, you know, once you do that, then they're going to ask you for something else. And then it snowballs and everything like that. So um, it's kind of interesting to see that it's come that far, you know, uh, because most people, most people outside of our world don't even realize that every new firearm comes with a cable lock or a trigger lock of some sort. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's that's news to them usually. We want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors, Chattanooga Shooting Supplies, Inc. CSSI was founded in 1977 by two families that had a passion for hunting and the outdoors. That same passion holds true today for the second generation of family members and their 200 plus employees. Own a gun store or range? If so, you understand the importance of two-step distribution to help you meet the demand of your customers. Their mission is to exceed their customers' expectations with a strong service focus from a knowledgeable sales staff, an assortment of trusted and well-known brands, competitive pricing, and timely shipping. With over 50,000 SKUs of shooting and hunting related products, they are in the business to help customers succeed. Learn more at chattanoogashooting.com. Yeah, like, and I, you talked about this uh, a, a bunch when you go into, and, and I, I love that you, like, that when you, you talked about the icky terms or whatever, um, I agree with that. Like, we, maybe we should have been learning and uh, leaning in, if, if only, to, if only to, to define those terms ourselves, right? So they come up with a term like corporate social responsibility. Oh, that's a nice word. Uh, it would be a shame if something happened to it, and we turned it into locks and all the guns. Right. I know you think, you know, I know you came up with the word. It means X, Y, and Z. Well, our version of that is this. So now we own the definition of that. What is, what is corporate social responsibility look like in the gun world? It doesn't have to look like that. So we can lean into their terms and then redefine them. Um, and you know, you talk about that too. Like when you were talking, when you talk about going to the Aspen, uh, that Aspen fat, uh, event and you're, you're in a room with the people, with the people who, uh, it's not an echo chamber for you you know, like, like it would be for if we were at NRA or shot or whatever. So you go into a room where it's not an echo chamber and, uh, yeah, the people are shocked to hear all the things that the gun, the gun manufacturers are actually doing, uh, and all the programs, all the things they, 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 and I, I have the same conversation when people ask what I do, cause it's so different inside the gun industry. And people are like, they, I either get one of two comments. It's either, I didn't know that there were, there were safety devices in the new guns. Or it's oh yeah that thing in the in the bag that we throw away and that's fine I, I get it but at least they're aware at least the people are aware that it's in there you know so Kevin you had, can, Kevin you you have a thought on that yeah it, it reminded me of that question you got from LinkedIn earlier what, this week last week it was does promoting responsible gun storage risk compromising self defense purposes and I think this this kind of mindset always has existed. You just kind of exemplified that of cable locks being uh, provided with every gun purchase was such a foreign idea. But then this is just from a few weeks ago when you were promoting responsible storage. What, what are your two answers to that of promoting responsible storage and the people that are hesitant, worried about how that could um, compromise their rights in some way? Do you want to go first, Mike, or no? Kenny, take it, and then I'll go. All right. Well, I mean, I've got I've got a few thoughts on that. I mean, uh, 
you know, safe storage compromising, uh, what the, 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 the ability to use your firearm in a, in a defense and like when you need it. I think there's that. There's also maybe if pr- safe, responsible storage is promoted, then legislation may, might mandate that everybody use it. I think there's a lot of concerns oh. some gun owners might have. I think both both directions you're going, Kenny, would totally work. Um, yeah, you, you left I, it very a, open-ended. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a few points on that, if you don't mind, if I can wax poetic for a bit. Um, so uh, obviously... Man- mandates is not something that I'm a big fan of. Uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh, I think that the more that we talk about, it, I don't think that, I don't think that the more we talk about it, the more it, in- it, it requires a mandate. Um, you know, and I think that, I think that a lot of the, I think those, those two things are, and can be mutually exclusive where we can go. There's nothing wrong with, again, see, secure storage isn't, isn't co- uh, controversial, but it, that also means that the more we talk about it, the less we're going to require a mandate, right? Uh, conversely, uh, it's not um, secure storage and uh, ease of use aren't mutually exclusive either. I don't think um, because we talk, you know, I've, I've talked in sealed carry for a long time, and um, and it also doesn't mean so. First of all, it, all, it doesn't mean a cable lock or a trigger lock. It means all the different secure storage methods. It means if you're a first time gun owner, get a safe, get a lock box. Use the lock in the box. One of those three, at the very least, start there, right? If you if you just bought your first Glock, you turn twenty one, you're like, this is this is the thing I think I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be a part of. Um, at the very least, use the lock, and at the very and if, uh, and, and go and if not, get a lock box. They're very inexpensive, um, and and or start start your collection and get a safe. Uh, like those things shouldn't be controversial, um, but also if you're going to engage in the self-defense aspect of it, there, there are ways we've mitigated that with technology. There's biometrics, there's quick access that, um, what's it, is it, uh, who makes the, the box that kind of to, to deploy it, you kind of find like a cord on a piano. You grab like, Three buttons that, at the same time. That ad I sent you last night, Mike. What was that? Yeah, what yeah. Is what? It? Strong box or what is it called? <laughs> what the heck is it? Something box. I it get, is. I get, I get, box. I get Instagram ads all the time for it. Um, and they were doing like a two for one, and they were doing a two for one special sale just recently too. That was is one that, of the it is the it's the ad with the kid, right? Like the little yeah, girl, and they're just like it. she's shooting down every Stop excuse. Box. Stop, Stop box. box. Stop boxes. That, that thing looks great. Get get something like that. Regal art. We make we make uh, metal lockable cases, and we're going to be launching a, a, a quick deployment line as well uh, in the, in the near future, probably in Q four. Uh, so those things those things shouldn't stop nor deter people from the pra- and then and then conversely, if you're going to carry it, obviously you know secure storage like the it being in use, carrying carrying concealed or carrying uh, out in, out in the open. Um, that's in use and that, so when it's being deployed and in a holster and whatever, you know, we're, we're not talking about those things, but you know, the minute it, you come home and the minute you're going to relax and you take it off, you stick it in your lockbox, stick it in your safe, run your cable lock through it, run your secure me enabled cable lock through it. Um, so yeah, those things, I don't, I don't, I don't see them as, I think that the, the less we talk about it, the more the calls for mandates, uh, are going to increase because to Mike's point earlier, it makes it seem like we're reverting to that cold dead hands thing. Um, and if we talk about it, we can own the conversation. We can shape the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. For me, like to answer that question, that person posed on LinkedIn, if I was having this nuanced conversation, right. With that person at, at a bar or something, I, to me, I would say there's nothing in my world that outweighs the fact that every negative outcome of a firearm gets used against us. Like if we were fair about it, like the term gun violence, which whether you're pro gun, anti gun or gun neutral or gun ignorant, right? Like everybody sees that number and it's all lumped together. So suicides are lumped in with homicide, (laughs) you know, like which is, which does a disservice to both. Like you, you can't find real solutions because there's no one size fits all solution across the board. So any negative outcome of a firearm due to negligence or being irresponsible 
gets used against us. So I don't want to really hear about like, does it compromise your rights? I don't care. We'll fight that fight in court. Like that, that fight's been going on forever. Like that fight's been there since day one. That's the pride from my cold dead hand stuff. That's why I always say, like, you know, I, I roll when I hear it, but I need it. I need it. I need it to be there. You know what I mean? And, uh, and it's easier. It makes my job easier when there's like one of the old timey, like no compromise at all guys standing there just being angry uh, because they're like, Hey, I can't talk to that guy, but Mike seems pretty approachable when it comes to this subject, but I still have the same belief system as him. You know what I mean? I'm just not yelling it or acting like I can't have a conversation with you or appreciate how you feel because it's never felt right to me to not let somebody who has been affected, um, and when I say like affected, it's like, you don't even have to be a victim or have somebody in your family who's been a victim. Like you could literally watch television. And when you see children getting slaughtered, <laughs> like that's, that hits you just as hard as, as, as having your own kids that have been in that situation. Right. So like, I've always appreciated that. So, the, so my thing is no, nothing outweighs the fact that I know that she's going to be used against us. You know, I think it's a valid point. To a, to a certain extent. But then again, I also live in a world where I'm like, you know, I, I remember like when I first started going into the mental health side of things and people were like, be careful, they're tricky. And I was thinking like, what does that mean? Like, the, is like an anti-gun person going to touch my hand and all of a sudden I'm infected and now I'm going to start compromising on my belief system? <laughs> like, you know, you know who you are as a human being. And there comes a certain point where you absolutely say no. You know what I mean? Like as a parent, when my kids, I wanted to give them the world, but there came to a point to where I said, absolutely not. I'm not compromising on this. You've had too much candy. You've had too much this. And I still believe that you can have that same belief system when it comes to, to gun rights. Like I was, uh, 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 the freedom attorneys were there, uh, on media row. And I, 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 I was in an interview with them. And um, at one point, the host asked me, do you believe when it comes to mental health that there might be some le some legislation that could be necessary when it comes to guns? Right. And uh, I said, absolutely not. <laughs> like, I'm still a purist at heart. Like, I, I don't I don't think you could legislate these type of things. I, I think that that falls under feel good legislation, making it look like you're doing something, but then you're adding to the stigma of mental health and also violating people's second amendment rights. And that's the whole point, I guess, of what we're trying to do here. Right. We don't want people in crisis owning guns or having guns. I shouldn't say owning because you could, that, that was the, the wrong way to phrase it. We don't want people in crisis having access to their firearms. We want them to get help, but we also don't want people in crisis. So we want to catch them, way before that even happens. So it's never an issue. That's like when people freak out about red flag laws, right? Like the first thing I think in my head is, is I'm trying to get to my people way before a red flag law would ever be enacted. I like red flag laws are a problem. We know that, right? But, but let's try to get upstream to prevent the unpredictable, right? Like let's not wait until there is an issue. Let's have those things in place for when there is an issue, but let's not wait to try to get to gun owners Let's get them before that. Let's get them at stage one, not stage four. I like where Kenny went with it of you have that question of what if, what if, or well, flip that question around. What if we don't talk about it and own it from the firearms industry? I mean, my team, we just ran all the suicide numbers and updated all the data Walk the Talk has, and it's only increasing. That's just going to give them more reason to put in the legislation that maybe people are afraid of. If the firearms industry really gets behind it and reduces it without mandates. Look at what that kind of valuable thing you have in your pocket. What, look what we were able to accomplish without mandates and legislation. Yeah. And we're going to be in an interesting, an interesting dilemma when it comes to guns aren't going anywhere. Genie's out of the bottle. Like, you know, I, I, I always tell the 60 to 80,000 guns a year story from Eagle imports, right. With no, no law enforcement contracts, no military contracts. This is 60 to 80,000 guns in the good years sold strictly to people like myself, regular humans that walk into a store and want stuff for self-defense. But every year 
we're putting millions of more guns in, into the, the market, right? Into the ha- uh, hands of, of Americans. Um, it's going to be, it's important for us to do as much as we can with real realistic expectations, right? But I don't want to do nothing. You know, uh, I want I want us to do something because that number, I mean, we're going to do our best to try to reduce that number, but that number might just go up just naturally. The more people you invite into the community and the more people that get involved in the community, and we saw that with all the civil unrest and all the stuff that happened during COVID where you had people from communities that you never would have guessed would go out and buy a gun. And I thought, I thought that was beautiful. I know a lot of people in the industry were frustrated because a lot of people were finally learning how difficult it is. You can't just go buy a gun in certain places. And you know, the whole, like, I wish it was as easy to, uh, to get a gun as it is to get a fishing license or a library card. And, And they learned the hard way that it's not as easy as you think. Right. Um, You know, we're opening this up to a lot more opportunities for people to own a gun and and live in crisis just by the sheer numbers of it. Right. You just can't you can't saturate markets and uh, not think that that's not a real possibility. And I wish we would have you know, I really wish we would have started tackling these issues. uh, I mean, I wish we would have started from day one, but let's face it, like, you know, I think a Columbine was like the first time that you know, these, these things were really, really discussed. And then, you know, you got up to Sandy hook and all these times that we, we kind of sat defensive on all those situations. Um, but it's all right. We're doing it now. Right. Like, like, but Hey, uh, Kevin, like I didn't get a chance to tell you this, but like Caltech, Kenny and I were walking up and I saw the marketing director from Caltech and it's my fault because I kind of dropped the ball on Caltech and and Matt was like, dude, where have you been? Like, we've been ready to go and I've been meaning to get with you. We were talking about you the other day. Like, let's get this going. Right. So now uh, there, there, there is another there's a new gun company, too, that I talked to that that has a serious interest in in putting the cards in the box. So you're starting to see these companies get it, you know, like they're getting it. It's a slow moving ship, but they're getting it. Yeah, I was there. With, I was there next year with that uh, with that new company, and and it definitely it definitely had a, the reputation as preceding you vibe, uh, which is awesome. Yeah, and it was had, uh, Ross Martin. Ross right? Martin. Was, yeah. yeah, Chris, who's the owner over there. It was funny, Kevin, because I walked up and I told Ke- Kenny, I was like, "Walk over with me. I'm going to try to get these guys to put because they make a nice gun. I mean, it was a beautiful gun." And uh, I walked up and I started playing with the gun. You know, because I'm trying to get their attention to come over and say like, "Hey, can I help you with something?" And then, uh, be a, may I help up. you riff? Yeah, <laughs> gotta be <laughs> sneaky. And uh, and Chris is just like, "Yeah, Mike Sedini saw the Walk Talk America on the shirt, and he's like, oh, Walk Talk.' He's like, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of what you do, man. Like, that's awesome.' And I was like, "All right, this is perfect.' I'm like, I need you to put this card in the box. Are you cool with that?" And and his him and his wife were like, "Oh, absolutely." <laughs> you know what I mean? So it it. You know, you, you want these people to to reach out and be proactive, but hell, like that just goes to show you, I, I got to keep attending in these things and, and having these conversations uh, because they were super receptive to it. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of little efforts that we've been working on that might not seem like they make an impact, like that probably wouldn't have happened four years ago. Who who are you? Who's walked the talk, America? It's little things like that that you seem to be able to feel to be a difference recently versus four years ago when we just came on with the website or all the little things. Yeah, yeah. You've well, been, you've been able to shortcut right to the hey, we put this in the box because they've heard of you and they know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, it still blows my mind because I I still have a very humble like. You know, even even with podcasts and things like that, when people are like fans of it, you know, um, this guy come over and he he was he was talking to me about avidity, and then I kind of he saw the Walk Talk America card, and then he put two and two together, and he's like, "Oh my god!" He's like, "You're the founder of Walk Talk America," and I was like, "Yeah," and he goes. I've, I've listened to you on so many different podcasts and things like that, you know, and I was just like, oh, that's cool. Like, you know, it, it's like, it, maybe I'm not the, the, the person that gets recognized, like say like a black Rambo or somebody like that, who's just walking through in a Coley Noir or somebody, 
even like a clover tack or a ghost tactical that everyone recognizes, but people are starting to make the connection. And there was like two, this couple came up and the, the, the kid was 22 and his wife was 21. And, um, he was a huge fan of walk talk America. Like uh, when I walked up, cause Rob was talking to him about it. He's like, there's, there's the guy who started it right there. And the kid was like, dude, let me shake your hand. Like, thank you so much. I love what you're doing. Uh, so it's just cool that people are starting to, to recognize it and see it and, and get out there. Um, you kind of hope everybody would hear about it by now in the gun industry, but you gotta, you, sometimes you get reminded that there's still so many people that haven't heard of it. Ken did we lose dropped Ken? off. We I'm, I'm still here. Ken. I think we just lost my camera. Oh, okay. No. We didn't know if you were like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm just punched <laughs> out. He extremely disagreed with that statement. Yeah. Yes. Screw these I'm clowns. Out. Screw these guys. <laughs> hey, Kenny, Kenny, yeah. tell us about what you saw at that VA conference. Cause I think that's a good segue into my time in DC, but how was that, that VA suicide prevention conference? Yeah, so Regal attended the the VA uh, VA DOD suicide prevention conference, and it was uh, it was an excellent experience. I'm glad we I'm glad we attended. We do Regal does a lot of work with the uh, VA uh, and the, their individual chapters as well um, with gun locks and their programs, and, uh, lock boxes, and some of the marketing prom, uh, premiums we do. Um, and I apologize, I don't know if I'm going to get this camera working again, but regardless. Um, yeah, it was it was great to see. Uh, we were we were probably one of the only um, exhibitors doing what we do. Uh, in fact, I think we were the only one. Um, and uh, so them being able to put a face because they have seen the, the the locks and they've seen the, the the boxes and all the other stuff that we've done. Um, so them being able to put us uh, in a in our our name and our face with what we do for the for them. Uh, was really awesome and they just they just ate it up that we were there and supporting you know all their efforts um and it was great and it's you know we've got a lot of follow-up because there's a lot of programs that they you know there were way more programs for lethal means uh lethal means uh safety and all these other and mental health uh, uh and suicide prevention that i wasn't aware of and so you know there's there's a lot of follow-up to be doing and helping uh both active service members and veterans in these spaces. For almost 75 years, Strum, Ruger, and Company Incorporated has been a model of corporate and community responsibility. Their motto, Arms Makers for Responsible Citizens, echoes their commitment to these principles as they work hard to deliver quality and innovative firearms. They offer consumers almost 800 variations of more than 40 product lines across both the Ruger and Marlin brands. And since 2021, Ruger has been a strong supporter of Walk the Talk America in full alignment with this mission and philosophy. We invite you to check out Ruger.com and browse their multiple products and help support our mission along the way. Walk the Talk America thanks Ruger for its continued support of this show and our mission. Yeah, and um, that's one I didn't get to attend, but I was able to get to the NSSF VA meetings um, right before the Knoxville goals meetings, um, which was, which was really cool. You know, you had, uh, Waco from the American Legion there, you know, you're getting these different organizations all coming forward. Um, unfortunately, I, I guess I'd say the only negative thing about it is I think we need a clear direction as a unity, something that unites all these different things. Cause you have all these different groups doing great things. Um, and it almost, gets to this point where it's like some of the efforts are duplicated, which is fine. And I'm okay with that because, um, some people have different reach, right? Like, um, and that's something I think that we have to accept in the firearms industry, just in general, right? Now that you have groups like Brady and every town and mom's demand action, like going this whole, like responsible, safe storage or lethal means safety route. Like they're adding that to, to like kind of the things that they do. So there are times when they're going to, they're going to get a captive audience that we need to be cognizant of, right? Like we need to be aware that, you know, the association for pediatricians, right. May not realize because they just might be looking for, Hey, we want somebody to help us with our messaging when it comes to firearm safety. And then they see like, mom's demand action or every town has like some kind of program and they might latch onto that. 
and this is why it's like 10, it's so important that we do it from our side, right? Um, Cause I think it's just, it's way more important to hear from other firearms industry trade people like about firearm safety, cause we really know it. Um, but different groups have different audiences, you know, so some of the work's replicated, but uh, that's the one thing I'd like to see is, especially with like working with the VA is just to see like more of a clear direction of, of what everybody wants or whatever messaging we can. Um, but we're getting there. Um, do you think that's achievable time. or do you, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to step over you, but do you think that you view that as achievable or do you view the, the idea that every organization has different messages, different um, uh, target audiences that uh, it would be hard easier or harder to get to a quote unquote lowest common denominator, but static message across all of them. Yeah. And the more I think about it, it might not be achievable. I think that there's joint messaging we could all share and kind of lifting each other up in certain blind spots. Like, you know, for example, like walk to talk America is never going to have a safe storage. Um, we're going to have that message, but we're never going to have a safe storage program. Right. I'm not going to tackle that. There's way too many, groups out there doing it, mm -hmm. whether it's a national group like Hold My Guns or, you know, it's the localized groups like TAPS or, you know, what Emmy Betts is doing out of the state of Colorado. Like, I would rather just be a reference for those those groups that are already doing it. But I think that there's, we can all have coherent messaging. But like, here's where like conflict starts, Kenny, and it, it becomes difficult. Like there are a lot of groups out there that carry the same message for responsible storage and, and safe storage that completely disagree with like st our stances on red flag laws. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Walk to talk America is totally against red flag laws. Whereas like, I don't know, say like AFSP and, and mental health America, like they, they're more receptive to red flag laws. Right. Like, and we're going to have to understand that like, especially when it comes to the research side of things or epidemiology, like they're going to have a different stance on certain things. Like some of these people are going to back stuff that we absolutely know doesn't work or maybe a barrier to entry. So it's like, how do you, how do you all become one or get onto the same page if you can't agree on certain things? I mean, I know how I do it, right? Because I, I feel like, I'm going to change minds eventually, or I'll make people see the blind spot. But a lot of us don't have that ability to kind of say, let's put aside the stuff that we disagree upon and work upon the stuff that we do agree upon. Right. Like, like let's do that. Um, so I think that's going to make it tougher for all of us to become like one united front. Yeah. Um, I was just, when you were describing all these different groups or the, the idea of all these groups with the different messages that it, it might be one of these scenarios such that do you remember you remember in the as a kid those those spirographs where you take the uh take a piece of paper put the piece of plastic over it and you have the different designs you put the pen in it and you just trace around it and around it and kind of it eventually would draw over itself and create designs um and all that is is just one giant set of venn diagrams and so maybe what the maybe we just have to maybe it's maybe it's our uh, or the way we perceive it, maybe the narrative we need to change it for ourselves is just realizing there isn't going to be kind of a, a, a big tent. And so we need to just create those overlapping Venn diagrams with whoever we can, even if the, the sliver where they overlap is, is tiny, we just do what we can. I know that, you know, I would love nothing more than just be like, ah, oh, here's the, this is the end all be all thing where we're partnered with these guys and these guys and these guys, and we're all on board and we have the magic words that, every government organization is okay with and every uh you know uh professional organization is okay with and every manufacturer is okay with but it, you know it might just be working in those working in those venn diagram crossovers and just figuring out what works for every one of them and you know and if, if that's what it takes it's it's kind of to your point about um why 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 would i everything we do is going to be used against us so if that, I would use that same mindset. And so if, if everybody's, if everything we do is going to be used against us, then uh, there is no cost. Uh, there's, there's no, uh, to me, it, it doesn't make any sense to not engage in, with everybody on every level and, and everywhere we can and create as many, uh, if we have to create many different 
uh, paths forward, then that's what it's going to have to take. Because again, the idea is preventing death by firearm, preventing preventable death by firearm. Yeah. I, I remember working like Kevin and I actually, I think, I, honestly, I think we were one of the first organizations, Kevin, um, that kind of listed out why we do not support red flag laws, but we, we may, we were really deliberate in the why, like, let me explain to you why, because I felt like everybody always explains to you why red flag laws are good. Right. And I was like the gun industry or the people that are on this side need to do a better job of explaining, okay, why we think it's bad, you know, not just, it's stupid. It doesn't work or whatever cr- creates more problems, but really explain the why. And I think that that's, uh, I think it's super important that we kind of get that message across through our side. Like I would love to see more like NSSF have their take on it. Like, it, but we share it, right? Like it's almost like written like commandments. Like this is, this is why we believe in what we do. And here's why we don't, because I think most people just, they don't have an opinion. They, they, they want to be, you know, they want to be educated on it or they want choices, right? Just like you get choices in everything in life. Um, I tried to do that with my daughters. I, I split them in half. I have one Republican and I have a Democrat, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I try to make them like see both sides of every issue. Um, and I think we need to do a better job on our side of explaining our stuff. I'm tired of the whole, like, Oh, I thought you people just wanted to arm everybody. I didn't realize like in that situation, that's why you were saying that. And I don't, I don't know, Kevin, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, is that out as, as someone who's now an insider and outsider looking in on it, helping me write this stuff? Yeah. I think it just takes a little bit more risk and trust from these organizations or key players that it would take to create an organization, association, whatever it is that would take the lead to unify everything. Because I mean, I know you and I run up against it where even companies are like, oh, this is awesome. And then maybe it runs to their legal team or somebody and the momentum just completely dies and it's gone um, to where, yeah, if, if there was a collective group of top influencers, um, firearm manufacturers, all the different players, you're not going to agree with every opinion that's out there and that's okay just be a part of the unified thing and maybe have some core commandments like kenny said that everybody agrees on and see what you can accomplish together maybe it's a national convention where the firearm industry is leading the experts on suicide prevention and having the top minds come together and discuss and really refine ideas and make some headway instead of everybody. Ooh, well, we don't like that one topic and that could be a little risky to associate with. Yeah, it could be, but think of the benefits that could come that way. Yeah. It, it, it it's one of those things that really irritates me because there are these conferences going on and I will be attending some of these things and I've attended these things in the past and I've never had anyone treat me with disrespect or freak out on me. And, and there's a lot of nuanced conversations. I think the gun industry just needs to understand something that like, do not be afraid to go into those conferences as long as you have viable solutions that people can wrap their head around and, um, you know, I've said it in the past, like you're prepared for all the gotcha moments or the tough questions and you can answer it in a respectful manner, play with other people's idea and his ideas in a graceful way. Um, I think we're, you're fine. We're fine. But it's like when I hear a firearms company, like I, I've gotten this excuse before about putting our, our mental health flyer in the boxes, right? Like the free and anonymous mental health screenings. And they're like, well, well, what if we give the idea to somebody or we trigger somebody by addressing this um, and, you know, they see it and then they do something horrific to themselves. And I'm like, in this day and age, like, don't you understand? Like that, as much as that would be a horrible thing, you realize like the, the mental health community would have to rally around a gun company. I don't think they think about that. Like if somebody tried to say Ruger triggered somebody to take their own life by providing free and anonymous mental health screenings, you don't think NAMI and Mental Health America would have to come out and say, no, you're wrong. This 
providing resources and talking about it does not cause people to kill themselves, does not cause people to take their lives. That right. That's already been proven by that side. So it's just like, have some faith. <laughs> it it is one of those things where the truth will out, uh, you know, and I think you're right, Mike, because it is like, it, it just happened in the, uh, in the NRA case, uh, I th- the one in, this, in front of the Supreme court is that at a certain point you're going to have, you're going to have, uh, strange bedfellows, I guess is the term or, uh, unconventional allies, uh, defending things that they know are defensible. You know, if, if, if the idea is defensible, you know, even the, even the har- the staunchest anti-gun people are going to have to defend it which is what happened in, in the Supreme court this year where you had, um, you had the ACLU, uh, filing amicus briefs on behalf of the NRA over their first amendment rights. Uh, so, you know, at a certain point you can't go, yeah, we hate this group, but we, you know, this is a clear, this is a clear problem. Um, so yeah, I think you're right there. I think that the, the groups, especially, especially something so, uh, so accepted as like the, the idea that you can incept, people that that, 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 a, that a third party uh by talking about by talking positively about uh getting help and um and and self-betterment can incept a suicidal ideation uh is just beyond the pale uh that that groups like mental health america and and all that would have to come out among walk the talk america's partners arms corps may have the most colorful history of them all but then again that likely happens when you have a company that's lasted for more than a century started in 1905 in the Philippines and expanding operations to right here to Nevada in 1985, Arms Corps offers some of the finest firearms you'll find on the market, from shotguns to 1911s, and from ammunition to a competitive shooting team, Arms Corps offers a lot. But there's something more. Arms Corps is the first manufacturer to print the free and anonymous mental health screenings link offered through Walk the Talk America's website right there on their packaging. If you buy an Arms Corps product, you will not only see our flyer inside, but you may actually see the screenings link printed on the side of the box. Go to armscor.com, that's armscor.com, to find out more about their heritage, their products, and their competitive shooting team. We're proud and thankful to have Arms Corps as a partner. Yeah, Mental Health America, What I mean... For those that have never heard the origin story, the reason why I was attracted to them, the reason why I knew I had to reach out and I wrote the Jerry Maguire memo, right? Like we got to change the world together is because I read their position paper, position paper 72. And the way they started it out was this is going to be a very unpopular opinion amongst our peers. But we believe just because you suffer from mental illness does not mean you should be denied your Second Amendment right. That stigmatizes mental health. And it, it's the same thing. So when I come across a bill or I see something that doesn't look right, I always float it to them. And there are things that we absolutely agree upon. Like Debbie Plotnick, the vice president, I, I, I consider her a, a dear friend of mine. We've had many discussions about how bad the New York Safe Act is. And and pe- the people at Walk Talk or uh, Mental Health America do not like what's happened in the state of New York. And it will always be against that and fight against that. So like you said, you will get these unconventional allies that you never thought were there because the truth and what's right always wins in the end, not necessarily all the time, but for the majority of it, it it will. And then you can call people out on their belief system if they don't back you up on it or they don't have a statement for you. Um, And I, I really would, would challenge any firearms company uh, you know, like be brave, like do something different. Uh, it just makes sense. It, it's, it, you're not going to hurt your customer by making, keeping them healthy. It's just not going to happen. It just may, I mean, uh, the stories become anecdotal, but I, I had a couple people, uh, uh, Joe Weir, right? Like he's talking about, he's had people contact him because they bought the product and it had, that mental health component in there that came out of left field that there's like, that's awesome that this company's doing this. Great. But yeah, on that note, folks, I think we're getting close to the end here. <laughs> I've done, I, I have done one last so question. Uh, we're almost an hour, but to wrap it up, what is one thing that, that goals did well, that was maybe different from other shows? 
Um, oh, let me think. Yeah, this is a this is a really tough question for for Kenny and I because we've done a million shows, right? Um, and then and, and I was only there as an attendee, so it's it's so from on its face as an attendee, everything you know, everything was done right. Um, I'm sure as if you were an exhibitor, I'm sure there's something where they go, oof, you know, uh, I wish you wouldn't have done that, you know, because we've done so many of these shows. It's like, oh man, could you could you could you close at noon? Could you you know why am I here all day? You know, that kind of stuff. I think, uh, I think having it is what they did right. It, yeah, it, I think that, yeah, going for it, having it, you're right. I think, I think having the, uh, the breakout sessions and things like that, giving people more options than just roaming around a show hall mm-hmm. is, is what they did right. Uh, um, very, very, uh, and being, being, being very media specific too. um, you know, like the meat, like the media, media presentations was a smart thing. Um, yeah, uh, especially like a sit down, like a presentation and not like, hey, come out to the range, come out to our industry day at the range, or maybe I'll make time for you at SHOT Show because we're all, you know, they're all so slammed or whatever. Um, I think making that a, a, a component was was a smart idea. Yeah, some of these shows are really beneficial to have meetings because they're not as slammed as, say, like the NRA show and SHOT Show. Um, so they're a little bit more relaxed and you, you have the opportunity, um, to kind of speak to people and, and kind of get to some decision makers and just have conversations. But I think when they were smart, uh, what they did, uh, when it comes to like the influencer side is they had, they had so many influences. There's a lot missing, right. But you can't, you can't have everybody there. And even if you invite everybody, not everyone's going to show, but there was a lot of like key players there that uh, are people that have large audiences and um, you know, they did some good stuff to promote it. Kenny, I did, I was going to make you do it with me and then I just forgot about it, but you know, they had that little circle thing that kind of oh. promoted goals. Yes. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the, yeah, the slow-mo camera or whatever that was. Yeah. Yeah. Where you followed around, they had yeah. all the props. Yeah. Was I was going to make you, do, I was going to make you go over there and do it with me and I, I didn't do it. I forgot. It my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I walk out, I'm like, mm. yeah, that seems right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they had, and Kevin, they didn't just have like gun industry people there. I mean, uh, that Nick Friedis guy, uh, for some, some, some listeners might know who he is, but, um, his booth was across from the Avidity Arms booth. And, uh, I mean, Kenny saw it, that dude didn't come up for air, man. He was, you know, he's a celebrity. He has like 1.3 million followers. Oh, that was a funny story, Kevin. <laughs> You'll like this. So, that guy has 1.3 million followers and he slammed and then behind people were just, you couldn't even get a moment. I think there's like one time we saw him standing by himself for two seconds. And, um, this, this couple walks up and it's a, it's a young lady and, and her, and her dude. And they, they wanted to see Rob. He wanted to see Rob Pincus, but something tells me like she wasn't necessarily a gun person. She was there for him. And, uh, it just goes to show you just like, we live in this world now where like you could potentially be judged for your follower count or some, you know, <laughs> some stupid stuff like that. But it was really cute because she does this, like mic drop moment thing where she's like, who is that guy? And I'm like, Oh, his name's Nick, whatever. I, you know, he's just, he's a really good speaker and he, you know, he's a government official. And, um, I was like, he has 1.3 million followers. And so she's like looking, looking him up on the phone. And like she looks at her husband, and she's like, "I have eight million followers." <laughs> I'm like, "Where do you have eight million followers?" She's like, "TikTok, right?" But like, that's a person <laughs> running around with eight million followers. Like, like that's an army <laughs> it was, of people. He's like, "Is that good for you guys?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's oh, and I, I should probably tell my Yehuda story just because it's it's unique. Go right ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, do you agree? Uh, I think which, it, I th- which which one? My pew pew juice story. I don't about remember. the electricity. Oh yeah, Orthodox. Yeah, Jeez. yeah. No, no, <laughs> what, what was the name of that? What did you call uh, me? The the, t- the the colloquial term, and it's it pop. It's a big thing in New York. Is you played Shabbos Goy? Shabbos Goy. Yeah, I was a Shabbos Goy, Kevin. You know what that is? 
I'd never heard of that term before. And I actually grew up in a, a, a Jewish and Italian neighborhood, but I didn't really have any Orthodox friends. Like most of my friends didn't, didn't follow that. But anyway, so we're the Friday, Friday evening, like getting close to the end of the night. And, and Yehuda goes to me and Rob, Hey, can one of you stop by my room and knock on the door and turn my lights on? before you go to the show. And I said, well, what, what happens if like we forget? And he goes, I potentially could sit in the dark all night, all day and all night. <laughs> so I go, I will absolutely do that because they can't touch anything that turns something on. Right. Um, so they can't touch the TV. They can't touch the phone. They can't touch the door. They can open the door, but they can't go in and out. So if even if the door were to shut, he'd be stuck. Um, yeah, because anyway, so I show up in the because the the event it's it's on Saturday. the The main show was Saturday and Sunday, and so basically the first day of the event, Yahoo is observing the Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath, yeah, yeah. So he, you know, so from Friday night till uh, Saturday night, um, he was uh, out of, out of commission, so to speak, out of pocket. So, yeah, yeah. He told me he goes, "Hey, man, I'm free at nine oh three." On Saturday, <laughs> I'll find out where you're at. But uh, so I show up in the morning, I knock on the door. I'm like, I don't know how this works. Can I can come in. He's like, yeah, you can come in. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm like, what do you need? Right. He's like, turn that light on, that light on, that light on. And he's like standing back and I'm like turning the lights on. And I was just like, can I give you a hug? And he's like, you can hug me. I give a hug. I'm like, I saved your life. I saved my Jew friend from the dark. <laughs> But it was it was the most awkward thing. Oh, and then we topped it the next night. I don't know if I told you this, Kenny, but uh, so so the very next night, um, Adam from Canic uh, Century Arms uh, and Yehuda and a couple of his employees, we go out to dinner. We pick a restaurant that has no kosher food, like right? zero kosher. Oh, so Yehuda no, can't have din- nothing. Yeah, Yehuda can't have dinner. He can have a couple cocktails and stuff. But it was so funny because at one point Yehuda's like, "Can I can I smell that? Can I smell that?" <laughs> so he's because we were just ordering massive amounts of food. I said, "I feel horrible, bro," but he's like smelling the dish. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, oh, this is torture. So, anyways, just, go hang out with Yehuda is the best, and he's got the greatest attitude. Yeah, on he's all such, this stuff, he's by such the way. a good he, sport about everything. Everything, his use of humor and and just. Uh, educating people about it too, because like when you're sitting at the table, like, but anyways, that's my, that's my story. I'm an official. What is, what is it? What am I now? Uh, Shabbos. Shabbos Goy. A Shabbos Goy. Yeah. So yeah, Shabbos, <laughs> Shabbat Shabbos uh, is the Yiddish term for um, Sabbath. Uh, Goy means uh, Gentile or non-Jew, uh, non-Jewish person. So, but yeah, apparently I, I, yeah. I listened to a podcast uh, the other day that with their, one of the guys, uh, they're all they all live in New York, and so he was uh, one of the hosts was talking about having to do that for uh, um, someone, uh, a neighbor that lives in his building. And I did it. I saved his life. I kept him from the very dark. cool. I thought Just, I thought yeah. he was busy on the show for, and he like handed you the room card, and you had a lot of power to potentially mess with him and have that inner uh, angel demon on your shoulder of like what to leave <laughs> on and what not. Well, that was the joke that that Pincus said to me. He goes, "Hey, man, when you go in there, turn his TV to MSNBC." Oh. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. Because he's Cause a huge he concern. He could change it. it yeah. And I said, "What would happen if I did that?" He said, "I'd have to sit there and listen to MSNBC." <laughs> there, I said, "You know what? I would have helped you out. I'd have came back like five hours and turned it to CNN just to give you a little." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Torture. Uh, all right. I- on that note, in that story, uh, let's wrap it up. I want to thank you two for joining us today. And I want to thank all of our sponsors. I particularly want to thank, uh, I want to point out Ruger Davidson Arms Corps. Um, I love all of our sponsors, but those three uh, helped us out with our Kids to King, Kings event that we had in the last two weeks. We got another one coming up. Um, that is, uh, for those of the people that don't know, that is our program where we go into underprivileged, underserved areas and we introduce firearms and life skills, not just firearms, 
uh, so much more than just firearms. Uh, we, we talk about PTSD, complex trauma. Uh, we actually have a, a, someone who, who provides financial advice to these kids. These kids get an opportunity to learn about all these things in a healthy manner. And most people don't realize that most of these kids will never be introduced to these things in a healthy manner. And uh, I think it's just a beautiful program. And if you go to our website or you go to any of our social medias at Walk the Talk US, um, you can see clips from the event that just took place. Um, like I said, I want to thank, there's a lot of misconceptions about the firearms industry. And one of them is, is that we just don't care about things. We don't care about kids. We don't care about people. And um, this is the type of program that really is smashing that stereotype of us. Um, and the people that are behind it are just absolute angels for doing it. And uh, it's the Kevin Dixies, it's the Devin Perkins. You know, it's, it's, it's really awesome. So I just want to thank those three sponsors in particular just for their help. They donated ammo, uh, way too much ammo. I mean, I mean <laughs> more than we even asked for to make this event successful. Um, and then Davidson's, uh, you know, came with, with new firearms for these kids to shoot and, um, you know, Ruger just for their support to keep our lights on and, 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 and make it possible for us to do what we do. I, I can't thank them enough. So I want to thank those sponsors, all of our other sponsors as well. You know, your Lipsies, uh, Chattanooga's, uh, NASGW's, like all the people that believe in this and want to see this continue and grow. Thank you from the bottom of our heart. Until next time, people, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you. Guns and Mental Health is a Freshcast Media production. For more information, visit freshcastmedia.com.